If you're into CNC turning or just love geeking out over precision machining, you're in for a treat today. Hey team, this is Luke of Practical Machinist and welcome back for another episode of The Lathe Lab. As a contributor here, I'm always diving into tools and processes and machines that make our lives easier, or at least more interesting. Today, we're tackling a hot topic, Swiss style machines and comparing them a little bit to fixed headstock lathes. Wait, aren't those the same thing? Spoiler, they're similar, but there's a lot of confusion out there, especially when you can compare Swiss or sliding headstock to conventional lathes. We're gonna break it down, we're gonna cover a few key differences and zoom in on some awesome features of Swiss machining that make it a game changer for machine shops. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. We drop practical tips like this all the time. Let's hop right in. So that was a video of a Swiss machine running a simple little brass part that's on there now. Before we dive in deeper, we're gonna start off with a quick history lesson to set the stage. Swiss style machining got its start back in the late 1800s in, you guessed it, Switzerland. Watchmakers needed to crank out tiny, super precise parts for fancy timepieces like Rolex or my personal favorite, Citizen. The inventor, Jacob Schweizer, came up with a lathe that used the sliding headstock to feed the bar stock through what we call a guide bushing, keeping everything rock solid and free of deflection or chatter. Fast forward to today. These machines, often called colloquially Swiss type lathes, use the sliding headstock as a CNC powerhouse. They're used everywhere from medical device shops to aerospace. So when you hear sliding head, when you hear Swiss lathe, the technical term is sliding headstock. I believe over in the UK they call them sliding head lathes. If there's anyone in here watching from the UK, chime in. The US, we call them Swiss style, but they're sliding headstock. So now that we're done with that very, very exciting history lesson, let's dive into a little bit more detail on what makes a Swiss a Swiss. So here's the inside of a Swiss. We got our sub spindle over here, and this over here is our main side. Now, one of the main differences that separate a Swiss machine from a fixed headstock is this component right here. That's our guide bushing. Our material actually moves in and out, but the guide bushing stays stationary. That allows our machine and our tools to maintain, as I said in the intro, maximum rigidity. The tooling is as close to 50 to 75 thousandths away, and I'll move one up, is as close to 50 to 75 thousandths away from the material. As you can see here, we're able to get very close with our tool. We can machine really long, thin work pieces without a support, similar to something like this. This is one that we had made on a Swiss. No sort of center drill for a live support. This was made in one, what we call chucking. The bar fed out and it machined it in one shot. No deflection, super precise tolerances. We're able to do that because of the guide bushing. While the guide bushing is stationary, so this collet back here is what moves in and out. So the collet moves while the uh, guide bushing stays stationary. That is what we call a sliding headstock because we know that that section of the machine is called a headstock. 
what holds the spindle. Another thing that makes it different is all this tooling here is what we call gang tooling. It all moves together. Where on a standard lathe or a fixed headstock, you can move one tool at a time. Here, our gang tooling moves all together, as in it moves in a gang. And it's the same way on the sub side. So you can see we have our sub spindle right here with our part in it. And as the tool, if we want to call it a different tool, the sub tooling on that gang style moves together. I'll show again. So as that moves, our spindle doesn't actually move in Y. It just moves in X and Z. And of course, as any sub spindle machine, they work together. And a sub spindle is what allows us to make parts one and done. Another example of a Swiss part that we run is this. We turn that on the main, we hold this in the sub, we do that turning in the slot on our sub side with these gang tools back here. And as of any, um, as most common with lathes today, they come equipped with live tooling, C axis. We have four axis here on the back and we have four axis here on the main. There are some Swiss with five axis, we don't have them. I think they actually have them as a true five axis now. So this here is our fixed headstock. And as you can see, this is not gang style tooling. Although the turret moves independently and all the tools technically move together, it's got a turret where you'll index around and you will call up your one tool at a time. So obviously this is not gang tooling. And the way that we index here, you're in one tool at a time index around and as you can obviously see the differences between a, a turret type tool versus gang tooling. Another thing that sets us aside is our material. This is a fixed headstock. It doesn't move at the main spindle, doesn't move at all. To machine it, our material comes out in one shot. So it makes it more difficult to do long intricate work pieces due to the fact that you would need some type of support. Whereas opposed to that, on a, fix, on a sliding headstock lathe, you have that guide bushing to help you maintain rigidity. And a couple of other differences between a Swiss style or sliding headstock lathe versus a fixed headstock is our bar feed. The bar feeds on a Swiss lathe, I've never heard of one that's running less than 12 foot bars. Whereas our fixed headstock machines, we like a shorter bar feed, we run four foot. In our Swiss, we run all 12 foot. Some of them I've even heard run longer than that. So you got your bar feed that's a little bit different. In addition to just the size of the bars, it has inside the bar feed itself, it is a servo driven. So as our sliding headstock is moving back and forth, the bar feed is moving right along with it in the same Z movement. Another stark difference between a fixed headstock and most Swiss machines is oil. We really don't use a lot of um, semi-synthetic coolants or any cutting fluid aside from cutting oil in a Swiss machine. Several reasons for that. Inside this component here where all the gang is, everything is uh, metal on metal, slide on slide, and it'll help to actually lubricate the inside of the machine. Back here, so the oil will actually help everything to stay lubricated. And for certain applications, I prefer cutting oil over coolant, such as threading, tapping, single point threading, stuff like that. And the guide bushing inside of a Swiss machine, some, some the guide bushing assembly stays inside and you adjust it there. One of the, lim the only one of the few limitation I'd say to a Swiss machine is the guide bushing itself. If you're running a three jaw chuck, you have a heck of a lot of stroke. Stroke is the high end of the open to the low end of the close. When you're using a guide bushing, it doesn't clamp at all. The collet and the headstock clamps, the guide bushing stays stationary and it moves the material in and out. The guide bushing doesn't open and close at all, at least not on our Swiss. So your material has to be very precise in proportion to the size of the guide bushing or vice versa. The guide bushing needs to be close to the material. By close, I mean we like to have them within 1,000. So if our material is 0.500, our guide, or if our guide bushing is 0.500 half inch, 
anything over 501, our material or under 499, our material won't fit that well. It'll either get jammed up or it'll be too loose and we'll face roundness problems as we're machining the part. One other cool thing about Swiss is they have what's called chucker mode, where you can bring your headstock all the way up and you can treat the machine like a conventional lathe, where you're not using your guide bushing anymore. You don't have your collet to your guide bushing going in and out. You just have a collet. Beneficial for a couple of reasons. One of the main ones is material imperfections. As we're running a Swiss with a guide bushing, your guide bushing to material ratio has to be almost perfect. But with the chucker mode, you don't have that problem. You have a little bit more stroke, a little bit more imperfect material shape and size can be used. So although it is in chucker mode, our tool is still staying stationary while our material moves in and out. So that concludes our introduction video to Swiss machine. One of the next ones that we're gonna cover in this Swiss series, we're gonna go over Swiss tooling, do's and don'ts, preferred tool method, limitations and advantages. It's gonna be a great one. It's gonna be coming up after this video, so keep a close eye out for that one. I hope you like this video. Once again, this is Luke for Practical Machinist signing out of the Lathe Lab. Leave a comment like the video, subscribe to Practical Machinist, check out all the other creators and um, contributors to their channel. You can find me at Crusader Machining on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.